Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Zane Kelly. I'm a chief of surgery and a trauma medical director in Tuba City. I'm also a staff surgeon at Flagstaff Medical Center. In fact, I work with Brian. Brian's my boss. So uh, I'm going to talk about trauma on the res. I think that's probably relatively interesting to a lot of people in this room, considering although most of our patients go to Flagstaff Medical Center, about every facility in the valley gets uh, patients from the reservation from time to time. Uh, I did have a provisional patent when I was a chief resident that I never made a dollar off of as my uh, disclosure. Uh, so we'll talk about the reservations, uh, facilities. I'll talk a little bit about tuba specifically. Uh, head trauma, contract health dollars, because um, I think that's very misunderstood, and then finally just challenges on the reservation. Um, looking at the map, it's no surprise that we have a lot of Native Americans in the state. Um, specifically the northeast corner, which is where the reservation is. Um, I say reservation because res the, the reservation is usually understood to be the Navajo reservation. I know there's plenty of other reservations in the country. The Navajo reservation is huge. It dwarfs every other reservation. Uh, here's a picture of it, and you can see it's in three states. Uh, the corner of Colorado there is actually the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation, but uh, the Navajos officially do own the four corners. Uh, you can see a little sliver in Utah, um, most of it in Arizona, and then in New Mexico. Uh, again, size of West Virginia, it's huge, and most people don't realize exactly how big that is. Three states and also 300,000 members with 170 of them living on the reservation. Uh, that's interesting considering the largest city on the reservation only has about 8,000 people, so it's a very rural society. The other thing to look at this picture of the reservation is you can see the little green odd shape there in the center. That's the Hopi Reservation. Hopi Reservation is a small reservation completely surrounded by the Navajo Reservation. And you can see a little tiny green dot just west of the Hopi Reservation there, and that's a town called Moen Kopi. That's a West Berlin for the Hopis. Uh, if you walk across the street in Tuba City, you are in Hopi territory. To make it more confusing, the time changes uh, for about eight months a year or so. Uh, very hard to figure out when McDonald's starts serving <laughs> quarter pounders. So Hopi, uh, 7,000 people live on it. Size of Delaware, uh, much smaller population, um, very different society. We see both Navajo and Hopi patients on the res, most facilities do. And there's also some Southern Paiutes that um, we see in the hospital as well. Um, facilities, so there's multiple facilities and. I'm going to talk about a few of them here, but they have a wide range of uh, beds and services, ranging from clinics to, to uh, hospitals. Some are federally owned. Uh, those are what you would consider formal Indian Health Service hospitals. Um, others are tribal or community. And the tribal hospitals, are you hear the word 638 quite often when you're on the res, that's the Native Self-Determination Act. That's a law that uh, allows natives to run whatever facility they want on their land. Um, 638 facilities are usually more progressive. They pay a little more. Uh, have more services. Tuba City is 638. Winslow is 638, and so is Fort Defiance. Um, almost every facility in Alaska is 638. There's very few federal facilities left in Alaska. Uh, I spent a long time making this graph, and I'm not going to go through it line by line, but what you would consider a conventional hospital in the valley, there's really only a handful on the res. Uh, Tuba City, Gallup, and then at the bottom, Shiprock and Fort Defiance, they have 24-hour ERs, they have ER doctors, they have general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, ICU. None of these other facilities do. Some of these range from clinics. Some of these are hospitals with six beds, essentially run by nurse practitioners. Um, Kayenta, which is a big referral base for Flagstaff as well as Tuba City, just got a CT scanner and actually just got the ability to inject IV contrast recently, in fact, last week. Um, Tuba City specifically is a ACS level three trauma center. Uh, our ver verification comes up again uh, November 2017. It's about 70 beds. It's about an hour from Flagstaff, so a lot of physicians like myself uh, live in Flagstaff. 13 bed ER, and depending on nursing, about a four to six bed ICU. We get about four to 800 traumas a year. That's a huge range, I know. I think part of that is just the difference in data collection from when I started there to uh, today. 8% penetrating, and uh, 90 transfers out a year, roughly. About two-thirds of those are going to go to Flagstaff Medical Center, and the other third are scattered between Valley Hospitals, between Maricopa, Banner, St. Joe, et cetera. 
uh, just kind of depends on a bed availability and what ER doctor might be on. And 15 TBIs, and I'm going to talk about that more specifically in uh, the next slide or two. So finally, this is ISS information from Tuba City. We had about 23. This was the last, this was, I believe, last November to this October. So 23 with uh, ISS over 15. So we get some sickies there, and we keep more, more than I think a lot of people appreciate because what people see is what we transfer. They don't see exactly what we keep there. Head trauma. So the Indian Health Service, which was in Rockville, Maryland, found that they were spending a ton of money on mild head trauma uh, the past few years. They hired an old trauma surgeon. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of a guy named David Boyd, but his, his website, his own personal website is an American hero. So uh, he was hired to figure out a way that the Indian Health Service could start saving money on mild um, traumatic brain injury. And he performed a pilot project at Gallup where Gallup would send CT scans to be looked at by a neurosurgeon in Albuquerque, determine if that patient could be safely kept in, a, in Gallup, which is um, New Mexico level three, and then um, follow up with the patient the next morning, essentially go home and avoid an unnecessarily, unnecessary flight, unnecessary ICU bill, unnecessary neurosurgeon consult. And during a little less than a year, Gallup had, uh, in the pilot project, had done this with 32 patients. They had four failures that they subsequently transferred to Albuquerque for change in neuro status or worsening CT. Uh, none of them had adverse outcomes. In fact, none of them, I believe, went to the OR, um, even the four that were transferred, and it was deemed a success. So when I uh, finished fellowship in Las Vegas and moved out to northern Arizona, the first thing that uh, was done was they sent me to Albuquerque to look at their protocol and develop one for Tuba City, and I had a lot of help from Bill Ashland from Flagstaff Medical Center, and we. Uh, we put together a protocol, and again, I'm not going to go through this line item by line item, but you can see these are very, very benign, simple patients, very high GCS, no Plavix, no Coumadin, um, no problems with any electrolytes, platelets. Uh, by the way, most facilities on the res don't have platelets anyway. Um, radiographic criteria, subarachnoid, uh, IPH, obviously no mass effect. Um, and one thing that we found out of this after we instituted it is, is we throw this out the window if there's a blizzard in the forecast because we had to have the ability to transfer the patient if something went wrong. So um, after about a year, we uh, decided to write in the, the, bottom one, the bottom sentence here, which is, you know, if there was inclement weather in the forecast, we would not uh, practice this. Also, Flagstaff would guarantee a bed. So we would not ever keep a patient that Flagstaff wasn't willing to accept if something went wrong. So by talking to the neurosurgeon and I on the phone from the ER in Tuba City, uh, Flagstaff would earmark that patient and make sure that patient got out of the hospital the next day uh, before giving up a bed. Um, this has worked great. Like I said, we keep a little over one a month. Uh, we haven't had any problems with it, and it has saved a, uh, a lot of money, uh, somewhere between half a million to a million dollars. It's actually strengthened the relationship between Flagstaff and Tuba City. And again, Gallup and um, Albuquerque are doing the same thing. So uh, like I said, I would uh, recommend this to anybody. I'd be happy to share our protocol with anybody. It's been a success. The ACS reviewed this when we became verified. So uh, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about contract health dollars. I think that's a very misunderstood uh, concept down here in the Valley and in Flagstaff as well. So. This is a map of the reservation. You can see the different service units. They're named after the biggest town in each geographic area. You can see Tuba City, Kanta, Winslow, Fort Defiance, et cetera, on here. Um, the bill that a patient might generate from a trauma or from any reason that patient might need to be transferred to, say, to Maricopa for burns or to Chandler, Flagstaff Medical Center, anywhere, is actually the service unit is responsible for that bill. The tribe is not. Uh, different service units are allocated so much money, and that money, which is deemed as contract health dollars, is only renewed once a year. So whatever can be safely kept in, that, in the hospital saves money for that service unit, and then there's more money at the end of the year for somebody to get transferred for another reason. Um, challenges, uh, really quick, are uh, keeping patients on the res. And one big thing is we just don't have certain specialties. We don't have cardiology. We don't have GI. Uh, we do have certain services more than others and cer cer uh, certain service units like Tuba City where we, we do do total joints in Tuba City. Um, we do a couple other things. Nobody does ERCP on the reservation at all. Um, bed shortage, and the, the biggest reason for bed shortage is not beds. 
Uh, Tuba City Hospital is full um, at least five out of seven nights a week, and that's not because it's full of high acuity sick patients. It's full because we can't find nurses. Uh, nurses are actually getting paid a lot of money right now in Tuba City, but they can't get anybody to move out there and work. So the bed shortages are actually nursing shortages. It's actually almost easier to find doctors to work on the res than it is nurses. And finally, uh, one of the biggest challenges on the res is consistency. When you do have locums, uh, you tend to have a lot of inconsistencies on what that locum might feel comfortable with keeping on the reservation or shipping. So that's one thing you hear a lot about on refer uh, receiving institutions is, oh, well, you know, so-and-so hospital kept this a week ago, and now they're sh shipping it. Why is that? And a lot of it is just because of the inconsistency with the different locums that are being hired. So that's it. Any questions?